I'm Claudia Shane. I'm a vascular surgeon at LSU. I met you all yesterday, so I'm going to try to excite you about venous anatomy. So for me, venous anatomy didn't get interesting until I started seeing patients in my office with various degrees of venous disease. And it's when you see these patients that you start figuring that you need to really understand these roadmaps, the venous anatomy, in order to figure out how to treat them. So patients will present to you with the earliest forms of venous disease, like telangiectasias or spider veins, <coughs> uh, reticular veins, varicose veins, or even worse forms of venous disease, like thrombophlebitis, DVT, uh, ulceration, recurrent ulceration, and pigmentation changes in the skin. This is coronaphlebictatica. This is a sign that you will see in patients, and it's pathognomonic for venous hypertension of whatever cause whether it's venous, uh, deep venous insufficiency, superficial, or perforator venous insufficiency. This is a picture with very advanced, a patient with very advanced venous disease, and so you can see all types of findings here, eczema, healed ulcerations, lipodermatosclerosis, active ulceration, and pitting edema. And you can see these extents of the disease with uh, any form of venous disease, either deep venous, superficial venous, or perforator disease. Usually, with the most advanced forms of, of venous disease, you're going to have a combination of malfunction in one or two or, or three of these venous systems. So again, there are three different systems in the venous anatomy. There's the deep venous system, the superficial venous system, and the perforator venous system. So in the deep venous system, we know these veins. They are the deep veins. They start, they parallel the arteries, and they start in the calf. And they include the, not only just the tibial veins, but also the perineal vein, the soleus, and the gastrocnemius veins. This becomes a bit of a question. Sometimes you, you get a report that there's thrombus in the soleal vein or thrombus in the gastrocnemius vein, and that is, in fact, a DVT. So the veins then rise up to the popliteal vein, join there above the knee. They then ascend up to the femoral vein up in the thigh, join the deep femoral vein to join into the common femoral vein. So this is the recent terminology. So a few years ago, Thank goodness they changed the terminology for the venous system so that these archaic terms of superficial femoral vein were removed. So there is no such thing as a superficial femoral vein. It is the femoral vein. And so the femoral vein joins the deep femoral vein to be the common femoral vein. So looking at these veins, there are valves present in the veins. Every two centimeters, they're more clustered in the calf, but every two centimeters as you go up, there's another valve, generally speaking, in the venous anatomy, although it's very variable. By the time you get up to the common femoral vein, there's usually one valve in either the common femoral and or in the external iliac vein. There's rarely a valve in the internal iliac vein or in the common iliac vein. So the valves um, are what really, you know, malfunction of these valves is really what causes the deep venous insufficiency. Another thing about the deep uh, venous system, these veins run through muscular tissue. And so the combination of the valves with the muscular tissue around the veins and the compression of these muscles is what leads to the function, the normal function of returning blood back up to the heart. So unlike the deep veins, the superficial veins don't run with muscle. They run superficial to the muscle. And in the superficial venous system, you have the most dominant of these veins, which is the great saphenous vein. We call branches of veins are called tributaries. They're not called branches. So there are multiple tributaries off the great saphenous vein, but basically it arises just anterior to the medial malleolus, it rises up the leg in the medial aspect, as you know, posterior to the medial epicondyle, joins up into the, uh, in, perforates that fascia up in the upper thigh to join the femoral vein. It's about two centimeters inferior and lateral to the pubic tubercle is where that saphenofemoral junction is. The other area where the superficial femoral uh, the superficial venous system joins the deep venous system is at the saphenopopliteal junction. So small saphenous vein starts lateral uh, and posterior lateral to the lateral malleolus. It ascends up the posterior leg and it runs with the sural nerve for two-thirds of its length. So right at that segment, you can see there where the sural nerve then deep, dives down deep and no longer runs with the sa small saphenous vein. So any treatment of the small saphenous vein is usually, usually in that area where the, the sural nerve is not. And so the small saphenous vein then joins the popliteal vein, usually about six centimeters above the knee joint. So the most common anatomy you'll find is the small saphenous joining the popliteal vein about six centimeters above the actual knee joint. But there are many variations to this as well. So the best test to evaluate veins is duplex ultrasound. And duplex ultrasound, there's no question, is the only test really to really define the anatomy in the, in the leg. 
um, as far as vein function, that's a different story. There's no consensus about the best test. So looking at an ultrasound, you can see there on cross-section this Egyptian eye appearance where you see the saphenous vein within the saphenous sheath. So anteriorly, that superficial fascia is the anterior saphenous fascia, and the posterior is that muscular compartment. So it forms this, this saphenous sheath that encompasses the saphenous vein for its whole distance. So there are many variations. You know, if you're looking at... Uh, to identify the saphenous vein, you have to be aware of these variations. You're going to, otherwise, you're not going to be able to identify it. So the most common one is the one on the left there, where the saphenous vein runs up its sheath. But you can have a true duplicate saphenous vein either above or below the knee. You can have a, any variation, basically. You can, have, you can see there E all the way to the right of the screen, where the saphenous vein exits its sheath for a small distance, or any, any distance, really, where on ultrasound, you won't see in that, in that saphenous compartment. You won't see a saphenous vein, but it's not that it's not present. So it's really important to really understand the uh, variations. So again, I said that there, the branches are tributaries. So there are really, these are the six tributaries I think are worth noting. These are the ones that you'll come to know very well. They kind of just sound like random names when you just look at them. But basically, the first two are accessory, or they are tributaries of the saphen great saphenous vein in the thigh. And then the next two you, you see there are great, uh, tributaries of the great saphenous vein in the leg. And then those last two, the posterior thigh circumflex vein, that can be also called, you'll come to know it as the Giacomini vein. And then there's the anterior thigh circumflex vein. That's the anterior thigh branch. So anybody who's been exposed to any kind of vein procedures, you would know that we commonly treat that anterior thigh branch or the Giacomini branch or any of these tributaries, really. So what does a patient look like if they have reflux in that anterior thigh branch, that anterior circumflex reflux? And it's a very classic pattern. You see a patient with varicosities running down the anterior thigh and go, wrapping around the knee laterally. And this is from that, that reflux in that anterior circumflex branch. And you can see here, this is a CT venogram. You wouldn't use this, really, to diagnose a patient. Uh, fortunately, this was a study I took these pictures from. But you can see there where the varicosity is really well uh, delineated there on that uh, CT venogram and how it's coming off of that circumflex branch and giving rise to a varicosity. So again, the saphenous vein, as I mentioned, it, it has variations in, as far as its anatomy. Most commonly, it joins the popliteal vein uh, just above the knee. And it can join it low, it can join it at a higher location, and it actually can never join. So sometimes the small saphenous vein never connects with that popliteal vein. And so one of the um, ways that you can identify a small saphenous reflux on a patient would be the presence of calf varicosity. So if a patient's varicose veins are predominantly in their calf, that's an indication that it's likely to be small saphenous vein reflux. And you can see here on this picture, you can see where the small saphenous vein, the posterior calf, would be incompetent in this whole varicosity that's arising from that. And again, this, this picture actually I thought was interesting because you can also have intersaphenous veins. So there are branches in the thigh and in the leg where the GSV and the SSV are communicating. And so there's one there between the hours. And you can see where reflux in either that GSV or the SSV can lead to a varicosity, depending on where it's coming from. And sometimes it can be both. So another variation in the small saphenous vein that's really worth noting is this, this pattern here. So in the middle you can see there is a cranial extension of the small saphenous vein and it really looks like it terminates in these muscular branches there and it's the you know, direction of flow is a, as it's indicated here in this picture down into the popliteal vein. So that is a, that's called a cranial extension of your small saphenous vein. The other version of a cranial extension of your small saphenous vein is called a Giacomini vein and so that's when it wraps around and joins the GSV. So this would be one connection really between the SSV and the GSV would be the Giacomini vein. And this is a not too uncommon source of reflux in patients. And so a, a patient, this is another picture here where you can see the G vein of Giacomini. It's the cranial extension of the short saphenous, small saphenous vein rather. It's not called the short anymore. It's the small. The cranial extension of the small saphenous vein, it wraps around the medial thigh to join the GSV uh, at any location in the proximal segment of the GSV. A patient who has reflux in that Giacomini vein, they may have varicosities that look like this, posterior thigh or posterior calf. And here another depiction you can see here really well on this patient's posterior thigh, how they have these like curly varicosities extending, wrapping all the way around to the anterior thigh. So that's, that's kind of typical of Giacomini vein reflux. So in the superficial venous system, you have the saphenous, both great and small, and then you also have these reticular veins. So reticular veins drain all the skin and subcutaneous tissue. They can drain either directly into tributaries, or in this picture here, it's hard to really make sense of it, but you can see some of these actual reticular and telangiectasias are direct, directly from a deep vein. 
So you can have valves in these reticular veins. So even though they're very small, they tend to be uh, less than three millimeters in diameter. They're not that insignificant. They can give rise to these patterns of telangiectasias. And sometimes when you see a patient with really bad telangiectasias in the thigh, that might be because it's coming right off of the deep system. There's, a per, there's a, either a perforator or a reticular vein coming right off the deep system. So that's why it's so painful, is that some of these spider veins, they, they can just be cosmetic, but some of them are actually quite painful. So normal venous anatomy, again, the blood flow, you have to keep in mind, comes from the skin, goes down into the superficial venous system, and then down through the perforators to join the deep vein. So that is the other connection. So I mentioned there's a saphenofemoral and the saphenopopliteal junction. That's where the superficial veins join the deep veins, but they also join it in the perforating veins. So perforating veins are located um, throughout the entire leg and, and, and thigh. Um, if the perforator vein becomes incompetent, you can see that all of that deep vein flow comes right out to the superficial veins and then easily out to the skin. So perforator inf uh, insufficiency, is, it's real and it's painful and it's, it's really, when you see an ulcer, there's usually a perforator to blame. So it can be the worst source of reflux. So if you see here, this is another depiction. You can see how these reticular veins, capillaries are all completely connected through the superficial venous system to the perforator veins and then into the deep venous system. And so, I should mention too that there may be valves in the perforator veins and incompetence in the perforator veins is easily demonstrated on a uh, duplex ultrasound. So one sign that you have reflux in the perforator vein is the size, you know, anything greater than 3.5 millimeters in diameter. You can see here this duplex picture of a perforator. It can be very torturous as it is there and that's not infrequent and they can be large or a reflux greater than 350 milliseconds is also diagnostic of reflux in the perforator vein. And this is a good CT venogram where you can see very clearly this perforator vein coming from the saphenous vein straight to the deep vein. And again, another depiction of that here. So in any ana like anatomic textbooks, basically you're gonna see tons of perforator veins, these cocket perforators, the Boyd's perforators, but we don't use those terms anymore, thank goodness, for the new classification system. So now we have, instead of this very archaic system, we have them much more obviously and intuitively clustered. So you have the anterior thigh perforators, posterior medial thigh, femoral canal, paratibial, posterior tibial, and medial ankle. So basically, they're just classified by where they're located on the leg. It's very intuitive and very easy. This is something I thought was worth adding. Uh, the perforators usually, if they're in the lower leg, but this becomes very relevant when you're trying to treat an ulcer and you want to ablate a perforator, you want to treat that perforator. They're usually not coming off of the great saphenous, but rather coming off of an accessory uh, branch, a tributary of the great saphenous. And it's specifically called the posterior accessory great saphenous vein. So, you know, if you don't actually understand this anatomy, you don't look for this specific branch, then you're going to think you're looking at the saphenous vein, but in fact, you're looking at a, an accessory. And it's important just in trying to treat that. 